What if I told you that one of the leading causes of death in the United States that affects nearly 11% of people could be prevented and even reversed? 38 million Americans are living with diabetes, and some of them don't even know it. And the majority of the 98 million people with pre-diabetes don't know they have it. If you're over the age of 18, the incidence of pre-diabetes is 38%. But if you're over the age of 65, it's nearly 49%. Could you be one of them? You're listening to Healthy Looks Great on You, a lifestyle medicine podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Vicki Petz Casper. For two decades, I practiced as a board certified obstetrician gynecologist, navigating the intricate world of women's health. But life took an unexpected turn when my own health faltered. Emerging on the other side, I discovered the transformative power of lifestyle medicine. Now I'm on a mission to share its incredible benefits with you. So buckle up because we are embarking on a journey to our very own mini medical school where you'll learn how lifestyle medicine can help prevent, treat, and sometimes even reverse disease. This is episode 114, Reversing Diabetes. Today we're going to discuss what is known in the South as sugar diabetes. And maybe we should change the name from diabetes to diabetes because it affects so many of us. And the rate is increasing around the globe. We will only focus on type 2 diabetes in this episode, which is typically insulin resistance, formerly known as adult onset diabetes. You may have pre-diabetes or diabetes and not even know it. 25% of people with diabetes don't realize they have it, and as many as 80% of people with pre-diabetes are completely asymptomatic. In fact, you can be symptom-free for years, but Don't mistake silence for harmlessness because too much sugar in your blood causes long-term damage to blood vessels, kidneys, nerves, and the heart. And that can start in the pre-diabetes phase. It can even cause hearing damage and an increased risk for the development of dementia. Once the complications start to occur, nearly every aspect of your health can be affected. Pre-diabetes is a wake-up call that your insulin levels are increasing. And besides prevention, this is the best time to stop or delay progression to type 2 diabetes. Left to its own devices, type 2 diabetes wreaks havoc on your body. Yes, of course, I'm going to tell you how to prevent, treat, and even reverse this devastating diagnosis. Just hang in there with me. One in every three adults is affected by pre-diabetes. That means look to your right, look to your left, And if one of those people doesn't have pre-diabetes, look in the mirror. Who, me? Yes, you and me. In fact, diabetes is the very reason I became interested in lifestyle medicine in the first place. You see, I had to take a really high dose of the evil drug prednisone. It tried to kill me and almost succeeded. My blood sugars went through the roof every time I swallowed that wicked little pill. I took metformin, Genuvia, and insulin shots to keep my blood sugar under 300. And because of the wild fluctuations, I felt terrible. In fact, I just wanted to sleep all the time, not to mention the classic symptoms I had, like a weird, unquenchable thirst in the back of my throat, an insatiable appetite that never stopped, a gazillion trips to the bathroom to urinate both day and night, and the sensation that someone was grabbing onto my lower legs. By the way, when I first mentioned this one, the doctors thought I was crazy because they didn't know I had diabetes. But what I did have was peripheral neuropathy. And though I very well may have been crazy on that high dose of steroids, the sensation was real. I'm not sure if my vision was affected because I couldn't see well anyway. Other symptoms I missed out on included frequent infections, non-healing sores, and dark skin under the armpits or behind the neck. Other than that, I had them all. So, why me? Let's take a look at risk factors. We always look at the things we can change or control and the things we can't. Let's start with the things we need to just pray the serenity prayer over. First is increasing age. It's one of those risk factors you can't do anything about. But once you pass the big 4-0, your risks go up. 
and especially after 45. Although we are now seeing an increase in younger adults, adolescents, and even kids. I will link the episode page to the podcast in the show notes so you can look up my interview with Dr. Black and Pediatric Trends. Next on the list of things beyond our control is ethnicity. Certain groups have an increased risk, such as African American, Hispanic or Latino, Native American, Asian American, and Pacific Islander. And for most things in life, we're told to make wise choices, but we don't get to choose our parents. And that has a big impact on the risk of developing diabetes. I remember when my dad received his diagnosis. He had gone to the hospital to have an aneurysm in his leg repaired. The doctor came in and told us that he wouldn't be having surgery because his blood sugar was over 400. Before we left the hospital, an endocrinologist came to see him. And I distinctly remember her saying, Sir, you have diabetes. I am not saying you might have diabetes, and I am not saying I think you have diabetes. I am saying you have diabetes. And I'm just going to infer that she probably had a lot of people who tried to deny the diagnosis. You know, they say things like, oh, it's probably because I had a piece of pie last night before I went to bed. Well, since you brought that up, let's step into the classroom and learn what happens to pie in the bloodstream. Okay, class, today in mini medical school, we are going on a sweet journey that starts with a bite and a sip. Ready? Whenever you eat food or anything with sugar or carbohydrates in it, your body turns that sugar or carbohydrate into something affectionately known as glucose. Now, the design is that glucose would be carried through the bloodstream out to all the organs and cells so that your body has energy. But here's the deal. Glucose or sugar in the bloodstream can't just jump out of the blood vessel. It needs a doorway to go through. But the door is locked. Insulin is the key that unlocks the door and lets sugar out of the blood where it can cause damage and into the cells where it's needed for fuel. Insulin is a hormone and it's made in the pancreas, which is a carrot-shaped organ just under the rib cage on your left side, kind of up under the stomach. Normally, a high level of sugar in the blood causes insulin production in the pancreas to go up. Then blood sugar comes down and the pancreas sort of backs off. So that's why it doesn't really matter that you ate that pie. I mean, it does matter, but if everything's humming along normally, your pancreas would regulate it. But if your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin, or if your body develops resistance to insulin, then all that sugar's on the wrong side of the door. It's in the blood. With insulin resistance, fat cells, muscle cells, and the liver don't use insulin properly, and the key doesn't unlock the door. And that causes hyperglycemia. That's your vocabulary word for the day. Hyperglycemia. Hyper means a lot and glycemia sort of means sweet. So we say hyperglycemia for high blood sugar. So what's a pancreas to do if the insulin it made didn't work at the cellular level? Well, what would you do if you cooked a dinner and it wasn't enough to feed everyone? You'd keep cooking more. But the pancreas just can't keep up. Eventually, it wears out. To make it really simple, this is bad. Over time, hyperglycemia can cause blindness, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, nerve damage, and amputations of the feet, legs, and toes. And this is all due to the effect on circulation. In fact, diabetes is one of the leading causes of death. So what if you just cut out sugar? Well, first of all, can you really cut out sugar and all carbohydrates from your diet? No, and you shouldn't. Glucose is a main source of energy for cells in things like your muscles. So you need to fill your tank. You just don't need to overfill it, and you need to fill it with nutritious foods that don't strain every cell in your body. Glucose comes not only from your food and drink, but your liver stores and makes it. So even if you could completely eliminate sugar from your diet, you would still have glucose in your blood. When glucose levels are low, the liver gets out its sledgehammer and breaks down stores of glycogen so that glucose levels in the blood return to normal. See, when it all works, your blood sugar levels would be normal. You can blame it on the pie, but if your blood sugar is high after pie, something is amiss. Not that the pie didn't contribute to the problem in the first place, it did. But at this point, it's going to take more than tossing the pie in the trash to correct it. 
Here's why. Over time, those overworked insulin-making machines in the islets of Langerhans are damaged, so they aren't effective anymore. Are you ready for some good news? Well, in the past, doctors thought that once they hit their limit, they were out of commission. But now, research indicates that certain cells called beta cells may be able to go to rehab and start working properly again, which results in a pancreas that releases insulin in a fine-tuned orchestra that controls blood sugar. How sweet is that? I'm going to tell you how, but first a little bad news. The chances of recovering those insulin-making cells in the pancreas are best early in the process. So if you want to wake up your beta cells, it's time to get serious now. Because making a little change here and a little change there and taking a pill while you slowly work on your lifestyle may tip you over the edge where it's too late and no longer reversible. Now, wait right there. I did not tell you to stop taking your medicine. I did say you've got some work to do. And let me just go ahead and say it. For most people, the secret to recovering is weight loss. People with diabetes who haven't had it very long and aren't on insulin may be able to reverse it by lowering the levels of fat in the liver and pancreas. And people with pre-diabetes can prevent or at least delay developing diabetes even with modest weight loss, especially when physical activity and stress management are also used. I'll give you some specifics in a moment. But pre-diabetes is a big deal. It ups the risk for heart disease, stroke, and even cancer. It's often associated with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. Before we prescribe the treatment, let me mention a few other risk factors. In addition to family history, which includes not only your mom and dad, but your brothers and sisters too, people who exercise fewer than three times a week are more likely to have diabetes. Now, does that mean if you exercise all the time, you'll never be diabetic? Huh, I wish. But it is a controllable risk factor. Almost anyone can start moving more. And for women, there are a couple of other things I want to mention. If your babies were over 9 pounds, then be on the lookout for the development of type 2 diabetes, especially if you had gestational diabetes, but even if you didn't. Also, women with polycystic ovarian syndrome have a greater chance of becoming diabetic. And while I'm speaking to the ladies, postmenopausal women are at particular risk because they have an increase in belly fat and stress, and aging is accompanied often by changes in the social support system and healthy social connectedness is crucial for health. If you've listened to this podcast for more than one episode, you probably know the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. But for those of you who were just admitted to mini medical school, they are whole food, nutrient-dense diet, physical fitness, restorative sleep, social connectedness, stress management, and limitation of harmful substances like alcohol and tobacco. There are episodes focusing on each one of these, which you can find on my website. Go to you backslash episodes.com. So what should you eat if you have diabetes or you're at risk for developing diabetes? <clears throat> Remember, look to the left, look to the right, and, well, you know who I'm talking to. My old father-in-law had diabetes, and he always said he couldn't eat sugar. So he'd get himself a big old canned biscuit, slather butter on it, pass on that jelly, and drown it in gravy. Can we all just agree, that doesn't make any sense. The recommendation for all people is to eat a diet rich in nutrients from whole foods rather than eating calorie-rich junk food. Dr. DeRue is an internist from UCLA, and he puts it like this. Eat foods that come out of the earth as they come out of the earth. That includes eating whole apples with skins intact instead of drinking apple juice and choosing brown rice instead of bleached white rice. He also emphasizes the importance of fiber, and those of you who have attended this class before know that fiber is only found in plants, and it keeps us feeling full. He says we believe fiber actually feeds the bacteria, the microbiome in the intestines. When the microbiome is satisfied with the nutrition it has, it doesn't keep sending signals to eat, which could otherwise contribute to weight gain. So eat lots of fruits, veggies, and whole grains. 
The Mediterranean diet is a good example. It includes fish and some lean meats, but there's so much evidence that plant-based is better. Let's look at the proven research. The Diabetes Prevention Program was a 20-year research project that hypothesized that if an unhealthy lifestyle and an unhealthy diet can cause type 2 diabetes, then can the opposite be true too? Can a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diet prevent diabetes? What do you think? Well, according to this large and long-term study, an overwhelming majority of pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes can be prevented. I think I hear a little doubt in your ears, so let's explore the specifics of what research has proven. In the Diabetes Prevention Project, people at risk for type 2 diabetes were divided into three groups. One was prescribed a 24-week diet and lifestyle intervention. The second was given metformin, the first-line medication used to prevent pre-diabetes from progressing to type 2 diabetes, and the third group got a sugar pill. And the ones taking the medication and the fake pill didn't know whether they were getting the real thing or the placebo. Now, of course, the ones in the lifestyle group knew because it was intense. They took nutrition classes and had coaches that helped them change their behavior and lose weight and increase physical activity. Whew. By the way, I have a free seven-day mini course to help you change your lifestyle and unlock a healthier you. There's a link in the show notes if you want to check it out. It's not too intense, but you'll get a free downloadable workbook and daily emails for a week, and then you'll get all the podcasts delivered straight to your inbox so you don't miss an episode. Now, I bet you already guessed what happened in this study, but let's review. The lifestyle intervention worked. That's it. Bottom line, it worked. Well, it worked best in younger people and people who were newly diagnosed. Want to know how well it worked? Mm, I thought so. The diet lifestyle group had a 58% reduction in the development of type 2 diabetes compared to the placebo group after three years. It was even more impressive in the 60 and over group. They had a 71% decreased incidence of developing type 2 diabetes in three years. And the effects lasted 10 years for 34% of them. Okay, well, I mean, it makes sense that if you do nothing, you don't expect a better outcome, right? But what about the group that took the medicine? Well, they also had a significant reduction over the group that did nothing. After three years, the risk of type 2 diabetes was down 31% and 18% after 10 years. And here's something else. When the medication was used with lifestyle changes and diet, the results were even better. So, the moral of the story is, don't do nothing. Now, type 2 diabetes is considered incurable. Wait a minute. I thought I said it could be reversed. Yeah, but if you've got the tendency, it's still going to be there, lurking in the shadows, waiting to rear its ugly head again. So, we refer to it as remission because if those beta cells are already damaged and you're already genetically predisposed, then some little something like a diet change or weight gain can throw you right back into pre-diabetes or even full-blown type 2 diabetes. Hopefully you're convinced now that lifestyle matters for you. Remember, look to the left, look to the right, then look in the mirror. Ready to get down to some details? Since diet is a biggie, let's go ahead and start with that one. There are six recommendations. Number one, reduce consumption of added sugars and eliminate processed foods. You knew I was going to say that, didn't you? I have an upcoming episode on label reading, but here's a hint. Don't eat food that says enriched. I know it sounds good, but white flour, white rice, and packaged breads have been so stripped of nutrients, they got to add something back in to even call it food. And enriched is a clever word for, this ain't really good for you. Also, don't drink your calories. Sugar-sweetened beverages aren't good for you, not sweet tea, sodas, or juices. Better to drink water, unsweetened coffee, or tea. And just because I slammed bread doesn't mean you shouldn't eat whole grains. Number two is you need whole grains, and they're really good for you. But it's a bit of a challenge to find them. So look for words like 100% whole grain. This is found in some breads, but other great sources are quinoa, corn, oatmeal, and brown rice. And that leads us to number three, fiber. This one is super important because fiber makes you feel full. Then you eat less and lose weight. Besides whole grains, 
This is where your fruits and vegetables come in. Remember, fiber is only found in plants. Beans and legumes are particularly high in fiber and protein. So eat lentils. You know I love me some lentils. Chickpeas, edamame, soybeans, really any peas or beans. And I mentioned fruits and vegetables, but let's take a closer look at that because you may have been told that fruit is sweet and it's not good for diabetes. And that's really a myth. Now, you shouldn't eat processed fruits like applesauce, but you know what they say about an apple a day. Just eat the whole thing with the skin on. Number four, the truth is that the recommendation is to get at least half of your calories from non-starchy fruits and vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, but not potatoes. Also, berries have a lot of fiber and they're so good for you. And you know, I'm always pushing berries on oatmeal as well as smoothies with a little added spinach. Number five is meat. You're not going to like this, but hard evidence shows that people who eat more meat are more likely to develop type 2 diabetes, especially processed meats like bacon, hot dogs, and deli meat. Sometimes people think they're eating healthy because they're eating turkey, but if it's deli turkey, it's as bad for you as bacon. Did you know that eating even one serving per day bumps up the risk by a whopping 50%? So what's a serving? I'm so glad you asked. The answer may surprise you. A serving of bacon is two slices. For deli meat, it's also two slices. For a hot dog, it's one. Now, I know bacon is tasty, but a 50% increase, is that really worth it? Okay, you knew processed meats were bad, right? But what about red meat? Want to guess how much a palm-sized steak increases your risk? 20%. Chicken, egg, dairy, and fish eaters have a lower risk than red meat eaters by 30%. But those who only eat fish are called pescatarians, and they have a 50% reduction. And, wait for it, people who are vegan have an 80% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And if you're rolling your eyes right now and tuning me out, listen for just a minute. I advocate a plant-based diet, and that means get the majority of your calories from plants. Can you start there? Just try to move a little on the scale. It's not only good for preventing diabetes, but meat is also associated with increased risk of cancer and heart disease. Lastly, number six is eat healthier fats. I know eating fat sounds like a bad idea, and it is if they're saturated fats, you know, like all that meat we just talked about, but also things like butter and most oils. But what is good for you is extra virgin olive oil and the good fats found in nuts and seeds. And if you are a fish eater, then fatty fish have more omega-3 fats and those are the ones you want. That's a little bit of a tongue twister. Did you ever read the Dr. Seuss book about Finney's Diner? The freshest fish are finer. My kids loved for me to read that and see how fast I could go without tripping over my words. The American Diabetes Association recommends the plate method, which is fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables, a quarter with whole grains or starchy vegetables, and a quarter with protein, beans or lean meats, and don't drink any sweetened drinks. They also recommend 150 minutes of exercise a week to prevent diabetes, and you've probably heard that before if you've listened to this podcast for more than a minute or two. And here's why it matters. The risk of developing diabetes is reduced by 31% without even taking weight into account and 17% if you match controls by weight in people who are physically active. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine recommends a low-fat, whole-food, plant-based diet, stressing that remission, not management, should be the goal. And they acknowledge that intensive lifestyle interventions are necessary to achieve that goal. They also recommend aerobic exercise and not letting more than a couple of days go by between exercise sessions. Hemoglobin A1C levels are not reduced with exercise alone though, so you have to change your diet too. Being obese increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by six-fold. Whoa, that's a lot. Being overweight bumps it up to 2.4 times, and abdominal fat is particularly bad. The general recommendation is to lose 5 to 10% of initial body weight to improve type 2 diabetes or prevent the progression of pre-diabetes. Now, I know not everyone with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes is overweight, but the vast majority are. The other big contributing factor is family history. 39% of patients with type 2 diabetes have at least one parent with the disease. 
Let's say that another way. If one of your parents or a sibling has type 2 diabetes, your risk is increased 5 to 10 fold over other people your same age and similar weight who don't have diabetes in their family. And since that's not something you can control, let's focus on what we can control. The strongest independent predictor of mortality in patients with diabetes is physical fitness. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again, get up and move. We all know that exercise is recommended for everyone for good health, but especially for diabetics. But do you know why? Well, I suppose that's why you're here. Physical activity not only helps you maintain a healthy weight, but it also makes your body more sensitive to insulin. Just think, when you're burning calories, your body releases glucose and insulin works better at getting it into the muscle cells where it's needed. How important is it? Well, diabetics who are sedentary are twice as likely to die as diabetics who walk just a couple of hours a week. And more is even better. Exercise lowers hemoglobin A1C levels by 0.7 percentage points, whether it's aerobic exercise or resistance training or a combination of the two. So I guess I need to mention about hemoglobin A1C levels. This is a measure of your average blood sugar over a three-month period of time. So it's a good way to understand the big picture rather than a single value. Hemoglobin A1C values greater than or equal to 6.5% indicate the presence of diabetes. The diagnosis is made with blood work. Other lab values to diagnose diabetes are fasting blood sugar greater than or equal to 126 or a random blood sugar of 200, regardless of whether or not you ate a piece of pie. Now that we've covered the basics of diet and fitness, if you're still awake, let's talk about sleep. Not enough sleep can increase insulin resistance. It may also affect appetite, which can snowball into more calories, more weight, and increased risk of diabetes or worsening of existing diabetes. This occurs because sleep deprivation throws hormones like leptin that controls your appetite way off balance. In fact, the risk of obesity is doubled in people who have poor sleep. And the main risk factor for developing diabetes is being overweight. Want to know why? In a word, inflammation. It's the common denominator in obesity and diabetes as well as vascular disease that can affect many organs. And this is something that can be measured in the blood by looking at things like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, chemokines, and white cell count. That's a lot of science, and I'll need to devote an entire episode to inflammation, but the bottom line is that intensive lifestyle interventions have been proven to decrease inflammatory markers. And diabetics who sleep less than seven hours a night have a harder time controlling their blood sugars. Here's what happens. When you sleep, it's normal for your blood sugar levels to start rising early in the morning just before dawn. And if everything's in working order, then insulin unlocks the door, and lets that glucose into the cells in the muscle fat and liver. But when the system is not functioning according to plan, insulin can't do its job and blood sugar levels just keep going up while you're sleeping. One large study showed double the risk of insulin resistance in people who slept less than six hours a night regardless of their other lifestyle factors. Sleep apnea makes it even worse. And if you think Rip Van Winkle is off the hook, think again. People who sleep more than nine hours a night also have an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. It's almost as if our bodies need to be in balance. Remember that old circadian rhythm from the episode on sleep? The first six episodes of this podcast covered all of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. Nutrition, physical fitness, reduction of harmful substances, sleep, social connectedness, and stress. And yeah, we need to talk about stress. Stress is physically bad for our bodies. One of the main reasons is cortisol. It's a hormone that affects how insulin works. People who stay up late make more cortisol. So that's another good reason that sleeping habits are important. But beyond that, stress raises the levels of adrenaline. We discussed this in detail on the stress episode, but to recap, the fight or flight response is intended to help us respond to a threat. And we need energy for that. So adrenaline causes glucose to be released into the bloodstream. Diabetics are at a disadvantage when it comes to stress because the blood sugar is already up and stress makes it go up even higher. Depression is another issue. 
people with type 2 diabetes have a two-fold increased risk of depression. And it's a two-way street. Human physiology is so fascinating. You see, there's an insulin-mediated mechanism for regulating the levels of tryptophan and tyrosine in the bloodstream. And here's why that matters. It affects the synthesis of neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. When insulin's working properly, a carbohydrate-rich meal helps stimulate the production of that feel-good neurotransmitter serotonin. But in depression, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and sympathetic nervous system may be altered, and in diabetes, we know insulin doesn't work properly. And what about alcohol? Well, it isn't broken down into energy like protein, fat, and carbohydrates, but that doesn't mean there aren't carbs in alcohol especially sweet wines, which can have up to 14 grams in just a small glass. And get this, smokers are 30 to 40% more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. Not only that, but continuing to smoke if you're diabetic makes control more difficult because nicotine dampens the ability of insulin to work. And yes, I know it's hard to quit, and I've got an episode on that as well. But lifestyle matters because diabetes is the eighth leading cause of death. That's 56,000 people a year. And it's the number one cause of kidney failure, amputations, and adult blindness. The number of adults diagnosed with type 2 diabetes has more than doubled over the last 20 years, and rates are rising at an alarming pace. So don't wait. Take control now. Subscribe to this podcast to keep learning how lifestyle affects different aspects of your health. Lose weight and increase your physical activity, and most of all, be consistent. You'll get healthier, and healthy looks great on you. The information contained in this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered to be a substitute for medical advice. You should continue to follow up with your physician or healthcare provider and take medication as prescribed. Though the information in this podcast is evidence-based, new research may develop and recommendations may change.